Hotep Jesus, how are you doing? Right. Uh, life is good. How are you, man? Um, life is um, super, super, super busy, man. Super, super occupied, man. I try to stay busy, you know? Yeah, you, you definitely are, are busy. Um, you know, uh, you're involved in so much. The way that I found out about you is actually through Donovan Sharp's uh, program, The Seven. Okay. And, um, and actually, it was before that. It was actually before that. It was um, a one-on-one with Donovan Sharp. Uh, oh, the yes, interview yes, that yes. You did. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that interview and, and then seeing you on the seven, that's such a, uh, like, for instance, this past uh, show, this past Sunday, that's like such a, uh, um, like a superstar show. <laughs> I mean, like everybody. Like it's so jam packed. It's uh, amazing how he's able to, uh, you know, keep that, keep that, uh, keep it moving. Cause uh, everybody is, you know, has something really meaningful to say. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, now I found out about Donovan Sharp through Solomon Jones. Uh, Solo okay. TV. And, okay. um, uh, uh, and that was interesting, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I mean, I think I, I, I think I had some of the, well, not just some of the, almost all of the same experiences that a lot of folks have when they discover the red pill, right. Hmm. You know, uh, funky stuff and relationships and everything. I actually have a, a video series called blue pill testimonials and uh, where I kind of go through some of that. But, you know, I started asking the same kind of questions and, you know, it seems like other folks seems like they have had some of these experiences, too. You know, Mm. Um, one thing I find interesting with you is uh, there seems to be like this intersection between like the red pill thing, the political thing. Um, uh, I'm a third party voter, have been for probably 15 years. Um, and I probably characterize myself as somewhere between a black nationalist and a, and a libertarian of sorts, you know, okay. um, so I think politically we, we have a lot in, in common. You, yeah. You've been pretty, uh, um, controversial and outspoken about these, uh, so-called Trump riots, uh, in a pretty unusual kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, but so let's, let's, uh, so so let's, uh, just sort of, you know, go backwards and I I just want folks to get an idea of, you know, how you, how you grew up, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, just give us some, you know, how you grew up and, you know, family life and, and maybe some sort of critical turns along the way. Mm, yeah. Um, so I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth, very spoiled child, only child. I have a half brother and half sister, but um, I grew up an only child. They're much older than me. Um, my brothers, I think my brother's almost like damn near 20 years older than me. My sister probably more than 10, somewhere in there. Um, so, yeah, I grew up an only child and, um, you know, both of my parents made six figures, uh, grew up in a suburb and... Um, we had the nicest house on the block. We lived on the block with a bunch of Italians and uh, we had the biggest house on the block. So, you know, a lot, a little bit of racist innuendos came with that and, you know, a little bit of racial tension I grew up with in, in my suburb. And yeah, um, it, it, being a free thinker my whole life had me ostracized a lot, you know, so um I was still a social kid, you know, I still had friends. Um, but even with my friends, I just was like always searching for more, right? It seemed like they were just so into uh, the basic things in life. And I was just like thinking about like outer space and time travel and, you know, quantum physics and aliens and 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 levitate and and the force of the Jedi, you know, like that's where my mind was. Um, 
and, and trying to understand this thing, money. I spent a lot of my life trying to understand money. I could never understand money. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that's, 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 uh, the, uh, cliff notes on, on my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did you, did you go to college? No, nah, I dropped out. Uh, I went, but I dropped out. Um, I used to go to college just to hustle people out of their money, make ends meet. But um, it got to a point where I was going to college and I was losing money. I was just like, I could be getting money right now. So I was like, you know, I had really good jobs. Um, I sold women's shoes at Nordstrom. I sold mortgages. I was just like, now I'm on record label. And I just I just didn't want to be there really, you know. Um, I just, just didn't sit right with me. Something just told me, you know, like, this shit is whack. <laughs> Mostly because I didn't respect my teachers. You know, I just felt like I'm looking at them and I'm like, you're not exactly the beacon of success. So how are you my teacher? You know, and I wanted to aspire for more than a job. You know, they's like, go to school so you can get a good job. And I'm like, I don't want a job. I want to, I want to give people jobs. And it seemed like everybody that went to university was getting jobs. And I was over here trying to build businesses, you know? So I was like, instead of being here, let me just start building my businesses. So that's what I did, man. I just built businesses. So what was the first built uh, business that you built? Uh, I had a printing business when I was 16. Um, then I had the record label. Um, I had a photography business. Um, I was in mortgages, so that was all hundred percent commission. So, you know, when I say building a business, I was like really focused on building, building that clientele of mortgage clients and, and uh, keeping that money coming in. But I, I did mortgages for uh, quite a, quite a, quite a long time. Um, so it was between the mortgages, uh, selling mortgages and, um, you know, refis, purchases and uh, my record label. And uh, what kind of artist do you, do you, uh, did you produce? Hip hop. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I produced a couple hip hop artists when I was a teenager. It's a big hip hop head. Um, Huge uh, collection, record collection, well, CD collection, you know, um, and uh, dubbed tapes. I have this huge collection of dub tapes, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to that's, that that's, that's what we used to do. Um, you know, somebody had, you know, something that we, we liked and, you know, this is before Napster. So, <laughs> so, you know, you do the analog method uh, and they used to have those, uh, those double, you know, the, the double, uh, cassette <laughs> yeah. double, double decks and you could double them pretty quick. So, yeah. Uh, uh, now I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a jazz musician. I, you know, I, I teach at Ohio state. I'm the director of jazz studies there. And, nice. um, I, the college thing is an interesting sort of problem. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so one of the, one of the issues is that, um, so you're teaching students and you hope that there's a market so that they can actually use the skills that you're teaching them in the market. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the case, right? Right. And you don't really know how long the market will be the way that it is. Correct. And the nature of a university is there's this curatorial component, right? So it's not necessarily cutting, it's not the bleeding edge, right? It's sort mm -hmm. of, you know, 10 years behind. So whatever, yeah. you know, whatever skills that you're imparting, they're, they're skills that are 10 years old, <laughs> you know? And so obviously for as fast as things move now and as fast as technology, um, you know, um, you know, updates and everything, it's, it's just, in many ways it's too slow yeah yeah i can't keep up with the market yeah that's a that's a that's a challenge and mm -hmm. i think also uh there's this sort of
this sort of uh, insulated bubble, and you know, I call it the academic bubble. Okay. So uh, now I have tenure, and of course I have tenure, so I can talk this way, right? Um, okay. I can be critical of, of of it now that I have it, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe one of the downsides of tenure is that the longer you you've been in the in the academic bubble, mm -hmm. the the longer you've been away from the actual market, right? Right, because you no longer have to be concerned about how the market is moving to make ends meet, right? Yeah. You 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 have tenure, so you're you're yeah. you're locked in. So as long as you don't do something illegal, <laughs> you know. You can just be about whatever your research is and you can stay in that bubble. Now, there's positive things about that. And in the past, uh, what tenure was used for is, uh, is to create a situation where you could express controversial ideas, right, mm -hmm. without the fear mm -hmm. of repercussion. Right. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's as many... <laughs> that have tenure that are willing to do that mm. these days, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a challenging problem. And um, I think uh, many that, uh, you know, I, you know, folks that uh, folks that drop out often, they drop out because they weren't able to, you know, they just, it, it just wasn't congruent, you know, and the information maybe was too old. So oh, yeah. I think that what the what the university system has to do is it needs to reinvent itself because you have all of these trade schools that are cr creeping up and you have schools like McDonald's University, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> where you can go straight out of high school right into that. And then they're training you specifically for you know, for working at McDonald's right for the skill set that you need to have or yeah. the same thing i think google has a similar kind of thing you can just go go out of high school just go straight to google do your year of training on the job and now you're trained to do exactly what it is that they want you to do so it's much more efficient mm -hmm. so this mm -hmm. is a problem that the university system is going to have to figure out and uh, um if it doesn't it's i think it's i i, I don't know I don't want to be pessimistic, but uh, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years in, if, I mean, if it doesn't really make significant changes, I think it'll be over. Um, mm. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> so I, I, so, I wanted to, I, 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 I mean, did, did you ever think that it was broken on purpose? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I am aware that the university system and actually K through 12 in general, what's most important is to create compliant citizens. Yeah. Right. So yep. in order for the market to work, you have to have people that are the cons are going to be the consumers and they mm -hmm. can't be folks that are sort of asking a lot of questions and trying to, you know, tip over the apple cart, so to speak. Right. They need to be able to follow rules, yeah. <laughs> you know, do what you're told. They need to be able to take in information and give you right back exactly what you said. It's not about asking right. questions. Right. It's about it's about uh, being able to do that efficiently because you need workers that have that capability. Right. To keep the machine run, running. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to hear what you think about it, though. <laughs> think about what the, I want to. I want to hear what you think about the the. Uh, you, you said, uh, "Do I wonder if if it was broken on purpose?" I want to know what you think about that. Yeah, I think uh, you know you hit the nail on the head where they want to create a a being that's not autonomous, one that is uh, controlled and cookie cutter and thinks a certain way, acts a certain way. You know, college is more about creating a, a, a cultural entity as opposed to an intelligent entity. It, it, it's, it's about conformity instead of being unique. 
Um, like you said, it doesn't exactly cultivate an environment of free thinking and asking questions. It's more or less, here's how you should think. You know, as kids always go into college and they come out liberal and, you know, the communists and the socialists prey on them and, and they recruit at the university, so on and so forth. You know, that stuff is, is, uh, is by design, you know? Um, so, you know, I just think, you know, if kids are going to go, it's got to be for one of the hard sciences. You know, it's got to be either, um, it's got to be either um, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. If it's not one of those, it's, it's pretty much a waste. So, um, one, one pretty common mistake that I think is, is made uh, on university campuses is, of course, we know that there's this liberal bias, and you, and you, just, uh, you just referenced that. So you mm -hmm. know that there's this li liberal kind of bias, and more than just a liberal bias, because I might consider myself to be more of a classical liberal, right? But okay. the sort of definition of that is is totally different now, right? So, so really, what we're talking about is more progressive, and as you said, socialist almost, right? Mm. Um, so the universities, uh, they've done they've done these studies that show that a disproportionate number of professors, and you know, just just academics in general, they support Democrats. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking 90%, you know, something like this. And, mm -hmm. and then of course, conservatives or independent or something, maybe 10 or 15%. Yeah. And uh, I think what ends up happening is uh, because of the bias, the students, obviously they're getting taught that same bias. Yes. Now, I'm okay with you uh, a, a person sharing their bias honestly, right? Right. Everybody has a bias. You can't help but share your bias. I have no problem right. with that. Uh, however, I do have a problem with blocking other voices. Yes. Right? So I have my bias, yes. plus I don't want Ben Shapiro to come here. Or I don't want, you know some other conservative thinking or um, independent thinking, you know, free thinking. I, I don't I, I don't want that. Right. So we'll okay. protest that we want to keep that out. But then we want to make sure that the bias that we have stays active. Right. Right. Um, so the so here's the here's the here's the problem with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem with that is that when students graduate, and they're confronted by people, really smart people, that have a conservative or more of a free thinking, more of an independent kind of perspective on things. Since they've never been exposed to that kind of thing, they're not going to have any. They're not going to be able to hold on to. Uh, they're not going to be able to hold on to their views, at least not you know, right. critically. Right. right. They might be able to just dig their feet in and you know put their fingers in their ears, and I'm not going to listen to you. But they're but they won't be able to to they won't will not have been able to develop any good arguments for those positions. Right. Um, so if if your desire is to uh, replicate your own values, you know, as a you know as an academic that's that is liberal, you know, uh, liberal leaning. Uh, if that is the if the desire, then you're not going to do it by, you know, pushing out any other position and only giving them a steady diet of of your position. Right. Uh, because as soon as they leave the institution, they're going to be confronted by folks that think different things and they're not mm -hmm. going to know what to do. Uh, so I think that's a that, that's a that's a mistake. So I, I actually think even. Uh, you know, even, you know, if the if the desire is to broaden the minds of the student, then obviously we want them to hear uh, several things, you know, not just yes. one perspective. Uh, 
But if you do want them to have your perspective, then you need them to hear other people's perspectives. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, what they want, you know, what they push is diversity of skin color and, but they don't push diversity of thought. Yeah. You're not and, exactly allowed to think for yourself. At least not too far right. Yeah. You know, so, even center, even center would be considered uh, a little risque, so to speak. Yeah. So the, um, the diversity of ideas thing. You know, like, you know, that should be an egalitarianism of, of, uh, of people, but an elitism of ideas, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, ideas should be allowed to battle it out in whatever the best ideas are. Those are the ideas that we should adopt, right? Not this sort of, okay, we're going to just accept all kinds of different ideas, even though clearly certain ideas are inferior to other ideas. Um, I- um you know, I think an issue with multiculturalism is that multiculturalism tends tends to be uh, a group of, you know, five or six people that tend to look the same, that are making decisions for, <laughs> for everybody else. They're making decisions for everybody else. So it's, it's what they think is diverse. It's what they think is you know, would be a good representation of this other thing, right? Something yeah. they themselves don't know much about, right? Um, yeah. If you really want to, it, I mean, if there is a chance of actually being diverse, then you would have to welcome different voices and and then it, you'd have to give up some of the power. Right. <laughs> you'd have to decentralize the power so that people uh, could make you know, decisions for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, th- th- I think the reason that that's not how they do it is because you have to give power up to do that. Right. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I wanted to ask you about, so, you know, all the stuff that I hear you say, like, for instance, when you're on the seven, um, you're obviously a red pill guy. Um, and maybe in your, um, maybe in your thinking, uh, you didn't necessarily term it that way. Um, you know, as you were sort of developing that ideology or that thought process on things. Um, but was there a moment that sort of opened your eyes to in particular the the sort of dynamic between men and women and how it's been sort of it's out of balance the it's not it's not maybe as it was intended to be yeah um i was 16 years old and um man i used to remember this because i used to have so much pain behind this what happened, man? I, I had a girlfriend. Oh, I remember now. Yes. So um, I went to, it was a few instances. So the first time I actually surprised her at her house, you know, we, we were in high school, right? So I surprised her. I walked to her house from my house, which was several miles, um, maybe like two or three miles or something like that. So I walked from my house to her house and I was going to walk her to school. I was going to surprise her. And then she was like, what the fuck are you doing here? And she like caught an attitude. So I was like, it was, she was walking with her friend and like to turn me off, she started talking about like other boys. And I'm just like, wow, she's talking about other dudes in front of me. And I'm like, you know, we all walking together. She's talking about how like some boy is cute and he was hitting on her. And I'm like, but she was supposed to be my girlfriend. So I was just like, it didn't process at first. And then another time, well, after that happened, that, that, that moment changed to me because I hadn't been loyal to a female since, you know, like I've cheated on every single one of my girlfriends because of that moment. I just had a lack of trust. 
So for example, like right after that, another girl, she was sort of cool in her grade um, because she was, she was probably like the cutest chick in her grade. You know, I think she was a grade below me or something like that, or, you know, so um, her, uh, one of the girls in her class kissed me in the, in the, in the um, uh, by the staircase. And I was like, wait, I can have two girls at once. It was like, oh, wow, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I think this girl only kissed me because I go with this other girl and she's like really hot and she kind of wants to just prove that she can have her man. Right. So I started understanding that stuff. And then I went away on vacation to Jamaica with my parents. So I was away from my girlfriend and we were on an island in Jamaica and a resort. And I had basically autonomy. We're just on a resort. So I had a girlfriend at the resort and then um, her parents were rather strict. So, you know, she had to be in at a certain time, blah, 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 blah. So I remember this one white girl was, you know, she was like, hey, you know, I'll walk you back to your hotel room. And I was like, sure, whatever. And I was like, pissy drunk and shit like that. Um, and then she like hooked up with me. And I was like, wait, what the fuck? Like, you just saw I was talking to such and such and you like coerced me, you know what I mean? Kind of like, I, I felt like she tricked me because I, you know, I thought she just wanted to walk because she had shit else better to do. And then like, no, she like, she wanted to hit on me. So I'm like, damn, I could have two girlfriends at the same time on the same island on vacation. And I got a girlfriend back home. I'm like, yo, this is fucking cool, man. So then I came back and I was like really, really dark because I was on an island, you know, I was in Jamaica. And then my girlfriend was like, uh, I, I came in and I was like, you know, I, you know, I missed her. I was my girl. So I went up to her and she was like, oh my God, you got so black. She like got scared and like ran away. You know, there's that thing in a black community you get too black, right? So I was like, oh my God. So I looked in the mirror. I'm like, oh damn, I kind of did get a little dark. But I'm like, that's how she tripping. So then like, I just, I was like, whatever. I was hurt though. I was really hurt. So then later on in the day, maybe a few classes later, you know, when we meet up in the hallways, same time, she's like, oh, I apologize, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, it's cool, whatever. Like, you know, you're just shocked, I guess, you know. But, you know, um, ever since then, I was just like, bitches ain't shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was ruined from that moment on, you know, my first girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> you know it took me a lot longer to um uh it, it took me a lot longer to accept certain realities um first of all mm -hmm. one of my one of my issues is you know my my parents are still together right so what 51 years or something right and um, so I have this, I have this programmed in my head, you know, I'm not a quitter, right? I'm, I'm so, <laughs> so certain behavior that I think should be a strong indication that I should walk away. I just wouldn't walk away, mm. you know? Because mm. I just, hey, you know, I need to, you know, I'm trying to emulate, um, you know, my parents thing. And um, they're really the only people that they've been with. Right. Mm. And so as far as like, you know, my dad is great and he's been very supportive. Uh, but my dad has only been with one woman. Mm. Right. Mm. So. Um, as far as like having any kind of conversation where I was going to get, you know, basically game where I was going to get that and just get someone to explain to me, well, this is how it's supposed to be, but that's not the way it is anymore. And so these are mm. some things that you want to look out for, right? Mm -hmm. He was not really going to be a person that was going to be able to do that with any kind of specificity, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it took me a long time to figure that out. I, I finally figured it out, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, after, uh, after my first marriage, uh, mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it finds us all at some point, I suppose. Yeah. 
So one thing I think is interesting is there seems to be this kind of strange connection between the, the red pill community and conservatism um, it's an it's it's interesting because most of the guys that I follow in the black manosphere and the manosphere in general, they tend to be more right leaning or just straight up conservative. A lot of which are just flat out were like Trump supporters, or at least would identify as either being independent or libertarian or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, what do you think about that? It, and, and is it because there's some kind of congruence in the value system or something? What do you mean? What's the question? Well, I mean, I mean, why do you think it is that, those things seem to travel together. So it seems, well, the the sort of red pill kind of ideology and more Mm -hmm. political conservatism or being independent politically. Oh, it's called masculinity, masculinity. You know, Um, a a man would never play victim. Uh, And and liberalism is, is victimhood. You know, it's blaming other people for your problems. It's the opposite of masculinity. You know, liberalism is the opposite of masculinity. It's 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 quite that simple. Um, you know, in order to be a liberal, you got to be cucked, man. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there um, who don't identify with liberalism, but may hate Trump, and that's like a different demographic. But you know, to you know, when you look at people like uh, Marcus Garvey and you look at people like uh, Malcolm X, you know, those are people that would never go along with some liberal ideology right. and leftism, as you see today. But these are very alpha men, so mm. to speak, you know. Um, but with masculinity also comes like that MG toe attitude, right? You know, you, you get that, you know, um, I'm not afraid to think for myself to be blue pilled is to be, is to conform to, you know, also liberalism is mostly run by women. So, so guys, there's even predators that just hang around like feminists just to be around women. And then they, they, they prey on them, you know, and that's just like a whole, like, that's some weirdo shit, but. You mean like white guys who. Yeah, no, nah, I'm talking about like rapists. Oh, like dudes Ooh. that get chicks. Yeah. And like date rape drugs and, you know, mess around with underage girls, shit like that. And yeah, I, I've seen a, a lot of things on the internet that, you know, um, over the years on Twitter where people have been exposed for doing like really like grimy shit, you know. Um, and, um, and then the other thing is like these guys aren't or don't can't get women. So there's another demographic of men who can't get women. And you know, uh, following behind liberalism is the only way to be near women. So they cuck and 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 they and they bow down to them um just to have uh not only the company, but you know, that pat on the head like a nice little pooch. Mm. So, so there's this, uh, this sort of 2080 rule and coach Greg Adams thinks it's going to end up being more of like a 1090 <laughs> thing. And that's where 20% of the men are, are having sex with 80% of the women. Yeah. And obviously that leaves 80% of the men like out, you know, right. and obviously that's not. I mean, that's not a good formula for keeping the species, you know, alive, <laughs> you know, keep that doesn't, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Right. But, mm-hmm. you know, you have this disproportionate number of single mothers have uh, multiple baby daddies, right? So they're mm-hmm. sharing the same guy mm-hmm. and the assessment 
that they have where they will talk about all men are dogs, all men are this, all men are that. Really, no. they're talking about the 20%. They couldn't be talking mm. about the 80% because they're invisible. They didn't even mm. notice with one of, when one of them you know, was, was interested. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that dynamic, obviously, uh, like I said, it's not, you know, that's not a healthy dynamic. And I, I don't know how long this can, it can continue that way uh, yeah. without, uh, without worse stuff going on. Um, mm -hmm. Worse stuff happening. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, everything that led up to the, your, your, your Joe Rogan interview. So, uh, so I, so you did this, um, now how, how did the order of that work? Did he see that you had done that, uh, sort of, uh, reparations thing at, at, uh, at Starbucks? Did he see that first and then he was interested and then that's why he interviewed you? I'm not sure of the order. Um, actually somebody, one of his friends recommended me. They, okay. um, I don't know who it was. You know, I wish, I wish I knew who it was. So I can thank that individual. Cause that was a, a life changing moment for me. Um, historic, you know, I can't thank Joe Rogan enough. Um, I always say if I had a, a, a wall, you know, uh, my own Mount Rushmore would be like Tupac, Malcolm X, Joe Rogan, and like, Alex Jones or some shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw, I saw you were just on Alex Jones's show. Yeah. Yeah. Alex is cool too, man. That's my dude. You know, I've been following Alex Jones since like, I don't know, 2009 or whatever, maybe, maybe longer. I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, I think, uh, what was the name of that documentary he put out way back in the day? But one of those, you know, Illuminati, deep, you know, um, uncovered um, conspiracy theory things. And I just really got into it. I watched him, um, you know, show up at the Bilderberg meeting and I was like, oh, this is oh, yeah. kind of cool. You know, yeah, he used to protest. Um, He'd be out there protesting. We know what you're doing. And like every yeah. time a car would come by, hey, we know what you're doing up there. Yeah, he'd identify him, call him out by name, like such and such <laughs> just pulled up, you know. So that was um, pretty eye opening because before, you know, I only had this theoretical knowledge of these things, you know, like I knew of the name Bilderberg Group, but it was still something mysterious. But then he makes it real as he's showing up at the meeting, getting stopped in Canada, you know, and then you see the people pulling in. It's like, oh, shit, they really do be meeting up. This ain't like no conspiracy theory. This is they, That's them right there, you know? <laughs> So, um, yeah, he was, he was, he, 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 uh, he contributed a lot to my growth too, you know, but Rogan was cool, man. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like he hypnotized me, man. Cause I, you know, going in I was like, uh, it's like, yo, we're going to be on our best behavior. We're not going to say anything too controversial. Let's, let's somewhat try to be PC cause I'm nowhere near PC. So let's try to be PC. And then like, I got real comfortable and I'm like, at the end of the interview, I didn't even remember what we spoke about. I was like, yo, what the fuck did we talk about? It was just, just left my mind. So I was like, yo, what do you do? Hypnotize me? It's just like really odd. Um, very surreal moment. Um, so like, I never watched my interviews back, but that was one where I had to sit down and watch it because I'm like, what the fuck happened? And I just wanted to like recall and even as I'm watching it, I'm like, damn, I said that? Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was it was a wild time, man. Uh yeah, he is uh he has such an unusual skill set. Um first of all, he's super knowledgeable. Yeah. I mean, he knows like about like a whole lot of stuff. And so that gives yeah. him the freedom to be able to just start talking. And then it just goes some kind of magical place every interview, you know, cause yeah. he knows all of this stuff. Right. And, right. um, and then he's like, not afraid to be like, um, 
you know, like kind of edgy and assertive and to assert his own personality, you know, and that's not, yeah. that's not, that's not always the interviewer's role. Usually right. the interviewer's role is just to basically, you know, ask a couple questions and then stay out the way, but that's not what he does. He gets in there and he, he's trying to make you say stuff. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he gets yeah, in there. Wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, um, yeah, it's a r- really incredible dude. Um, and obviously he's the reason why everybody wants to do a podcast. Mm. Mm. He's the dude. I mean, you know, I, I have this microphone, right. I have this microphone, right? This is like the, <laughs> that's because that's the microphones in his studio. Well, I mean, that's, what microphone is that? Uh, this is a, a, a sure SM seven B sure SM seven B. And, um, he uses them. That's not the only reason that I, that I have it, but I'm, I'm saying it's the, it's like the industry standard. And, and you'll see a lot of guys, podcasters, probably about 50% of them have the same microphone. It's cause Joe's it's Joe's mic. <laughs> That's why. Is that the one Joe uses? It's the one that he yeah. uses. And this is the one okay. that you were talking in actually <laughs> oh. when you were on his show. Well, let's talk about your books. Okay, let's do it. I got this. Yeah. One yeah. Right yeah, yeah. Unbreakable rules of masculinity. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a this is a great document. A lot of people really love this. Um, mm-hmm. It starts out with uh, the inverse correlation of attention versus reciprocation, so people understand. Like I was talking about before with girls, you know, when you're giving them this attention, um, you have to be careful and you have to know, know how to balance that out. So you know, we start right off. I'm including graphs and stuff in there because uh, men need to understand a woman's cycle. If you understand a woman's cycle, you understand uh, why she's behaving a certain way. Um, but the the big chapter in here, there's several big chapters in here, um, uh, but one of them is um, women are the apex predator. It's something a lot of men don't want to admit, but on page 75, you'll have uh, women are the apex predator. Um, and once you understand that, it's the woman that's doing the hunting and um, it's the woman that actually has the power. Um, life becomes easier to understand. Women become easier to understand, you know? Uh, well, I right. they, uh, well, that's just like the thing with like mate selection, even in the animal kingdom, right? It's always the mm-hmm. women that are making the decision on who, you know, whose, whose genes are going to, 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 are going to continue on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're they're the one that are that are uh, doing the selecting. You hit that on the head, yeah. Yeah. All right. And how and how about your other book? So the other book is Dominate Twitter, and and that one is a combination of my marketing experience over the past twenty years. A lot of people teach marketing from a very theoretical perspective or some very like bland corporate perspective. And I get into the the deep psychology of why things work. Um, so my book was read by um, uh, a psychologist. He purchased my book. I believe he was a university professor um, in psychology. And he said he's purchased other courses and books on um, Twitter marketing and marketing. He said mine was his favorite. He said because it was very meta. You know, we get into the subconscious mind of things. And... Um, you know, I give some prescriptions in there, you know, some tactics some things that people can do. I had one guy who, you know, um, and said he could, he was going page by page, trying things out on Twitter and it was working, you know? Um, I mean, you pick up that book and five minutes later, you'll, you'll boost your, your engagement if you actually do what I say. Um, but it's, it's very, it's very psychological. So, it doesn't just work on Twitter, although I use Twitter as the platform. In fact, I have plans on just taking um, some of the concepts in that book and writing another one, a, a marketing manifesto, um, a marketing branding manifesto. And then um, without the social media aspect, because some people think that that book is just for Twitter. And it's just like, I kind of went over and above, you know, I show you how to, you know, uh, do SEO, you know, build a website, you know, the whole package to be an entrepreneur to really like launch a business. In fact, I felt really weird because people were buying my book and then 
the next month they were opening marketing agencies. They were becoming marketing consultants. Uh, and yeah, and they were just they were using doing your book. This. Yeah, they were just using my book, you know. Um, you had other people that would buy my book and then create a course, you know. Um, so I was just like, damn, like you put your stuff out there, it gets jacked. But at the end of the day, it's like, all right, fine, at least I help these people. At least, at least, you know, somebody was able to improve their life after this. So that was the take I had to look at it. I just don't want people using it for nefarious purposes. Um, but you know, that, that's, 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 that's really, you know, what it was, man. I just wanted, um, I wanted to help people and I had to look at it like that. Cause at first I just felt really weird. Like, yo, how the hell are you going to open a marketing agency and you just learn this stuff from my book? Like it took me years of experience to understand some of these concepts and you're just going to hop right open and open an agency. I felt like, you know, it just feels disingenuous. You know, I, I had to intern at agencies before I opened my agency, you know, I had to work for several startups. Um, I had to launch several businesses before I opened my marketing agency. And it's just like, here these people go. It's just like really, really odd, really weird. But hey, you know, um, if they're making money, then it's, it's, it's cool, you know. Now, how about your uh, relationship with 50 Cent? Yeah. Um, do we don't have a, a relationship. I, I, I worked with him in the past. Yeah, really, really yeah. cool dude. Really down to earth. Um, Chris Lighty is the one that got me that gig and RIP Chris Lighty. Um, but again, that was a life changing moment for me. That was my big break. You know, I was a touring artist at the time and I had my blog. My blog was doing millions of hits a month. And, you know, that was my big break, you know. Um, and 50 was very supportive. Um, if I had an opportunity to work with him again, I definitely would. But it's not like I stay in contact with him or anything like that. I mean, I still, you know, know a couple of people connected to G Unit, and we keep in touch every once in a while. Um, but other than that, you know, um, I don't really connect with Fifty. And you were involved in. Uh, um, I, I just, I just lost, I just lost it. Uh, a sports drink uh, uh did you you well, assist Carmelo Anthony yeah 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 after the 50 cent thing um that's when I became an independent consultant well actually the 50 cent thing I was technically an independent consultant I worked in the office like an employee but on paper I was an independent consultant um so um I started picking up other gigs while I was there and one of them was that Carmelo Anthony gig and um they had a sports drink of coconut water and he was a celebrity endorser and um, I helped launch that brand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it just seems like you just, whatever it is that you're interested in, you, you just find a way to make it work. You know, I think it's intuition problem solving and then like a high level of consciousness being, mm -hmm. being self-aware, like highly self-aware. Um, for example, um, I want when I wanted to get into mobile apps, I kept telling everybody, hey, you know, um, have you thought about even, you know, I was working with the Carmelo company. Um, I was like, you guys thought about going to mobile apps because they had several products. They were doing like wine and spirits and things. And I was like, you guys thought about mobile apps because they had funding. And they're like, no, no, no. And I'm like, yo, it's going to be the future. You should probably get into that now. And and nobody really got it. So I started, I dove head first into that. And um, I applied for this job at a company called Inbox which is a mobile messaging app. A lot of cool features, really, really cool app. And um, I didn't get the job. Um, and that was the first time I applied for a job, interviewed and didn't get it. So I was really dejected. I was like, yo, how did I not get that job? But I understood it was because a lot of the things the guy was asking me, these technical digital marketing things, um, app store specific things I didn't know. So I went home and I just studied for the next year. Um, when you fast forward three, four years later, maybe five, um, my partner now at Coinbits app, the Bitcoin company is the same guy who launched that company that I didn't get the job with today. He's my business partner or co-founders in the Bitcoin company, you know, but I didn't, I didn't take it as, you know, Oh, I didn't get that job because I, I have dreads or, or I didn't get that job because I'm black. You know, I took it as, you know, there was something I did wrong, right? Every situation where something didn't go my way, even if it wasn't my fault, I always took the attitude of, 
well, how could I have been different to change the circumstances of that situation? Because I feel like we're 100% in control of our environment and everything around us and situations that happen to us and people react to how we react or how we act. Um, and, and how we react to other people's reactions it sets another set of chain reactions. So, you know, I focus on being uh, highly self-aware um, and, 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 and always reviewing myself, right? So, mm. and, and sometimes it's to a fault because it may keep me up. You have to learn to, to forgive yourself. So it could just be, you know, any, any type of mistake that happened during the day and I'm, I'm reviewing it. I'm reviewing how I talk or, you know, missteps, how I present myself, just all these different things just consistently refine, 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 refine and get better. Um, you know, there, there is no such thing as perfect because um, our potential is limitless. So we just uh, reach le uh, higher levels of perfectness. Um, so, so, so that's my goal is like, how do I, how do I reach God level of, of, mm. of consciousness, a God level of expression? Um, so again, that comes back to like this intuition and being intuitive. So I, I rely a lot on my intuition, you know, blanking out the mind and allowing the intuitive thoughts to flow in um, at the right moments. Um, knowing when to use the intellectual mind and when to use the spiritual mind. Uh, when it's time to use the spiritual mind, blanking out the intellectual mind. And when the spiritual mind um, sends that influx of ideas, using the intellectual mind to work on them and galvanize something new. Um, and, and, and then, um, you know, problem solving, right? Is, is something that I'm just naturally good at it. Um, my kids are very good problem solvers. I think that's um, uh, maybe innate, I'm not sure, but my dad used to give me a lot of critical thinking problems, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, brain teasers, so on and so forth, that, that forced the mind out of a linear way of looking at things. Um, you know, like, uh, um, what is it? The, the fox, the hen and the corn, right? on one side of the river, only two can cross to cross the river at one time. You ever did that problem before? A vague, it seems vaguely familiar. Yeah, you know, so um, if you put the fox with the hen, the fox is gonna eat the hen. If you put the hen with the corn, the hen will eat the corn. And you carry two across, how do you get all three items? And if you leave like the corn back with the hen, you know, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, um, yeah, so like those little problems like that, they just force you to, to think, right? Uh, right? Lots of puzzles, lots of, and also I was an only child, so I had a lot of time by myself. And we didn't have like these cell phones and things, right? You know, you had, I had a Nintendo or a Super Nintendo, but those things get boring really fast, you know? And, and so, the, you know, I spent a lot of time reading and, and, and just thinking through things, man. But being very, very self-aware at an early age helped a lot. But you said right. you have kids. How many kids do you have? Four. You have four kids. Um, oh. And, and uh, I, I heard on one of your live streams uh, that you have a newborn. Yeah. 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 Got so, me a newborn. A little girl. Okay. Two so, girls, two so, boys now. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's, that's beautiful, man. It really is, man. That's beautiful. God, God, God bless you. Never. Yeah. My daughter wants to go to med school, so I'm going to be broke soon putting her to medical <laughs> med school. Um, so, okay. Uh, I, I just want, I had just had one, one last question for you and that's okay. about your name. Um, the, yeah. about Hotep Jesus. So where does that yeah. come from? Um, so, uh, right around the time that Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin and them were murdered, there was a lot of grief in the black community. And, uh, I was providing my two cents on, uh, how we can combat some of this so-called oppression. And, um, mine was very more, very much, uh, about black economics and, you know, they feel that 
that's capitalism and capitalism is rooted in white supremacy. So, you know, they were like, oh, shut up, Hotep, shut up, Hotep. And I'm like, you can't be a Hotep. Hotep means peace, satisfaction, or to be at rest. So you can't be Hotep, you know, um, be a Hotep as, as, as such as a noun. It's more of a adjective. Um, and they kept saying it and I was just like, whatever. So, um, uh, and, and plus, I, 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 I was very um, spiritual at the time. So we took on the name Hotep. And um, one day, you know, because I was I, I, sometimes I tweet from a higher level of consciousness. Somebody was like, what do you think you are? Some sort of Hotep Jesus? And I was like, oh, wow, that shit's got a ring to it. <laughs> so I trademarked it and it's been on ever since. <laughs> you know, yeah. the best the the best nicknames or the best you know names they come out of but the, the, it seems like they come that way they just come naturally yeah. uh, uh, my nickname thunder uh that's a nickname my dad gave me okay um, and he gave me that nickname because when i was five or six running through our house i grew up in like a 1920s old farm renovated farmhouse um and when I'd run through the house, it would it was thunderous because thump 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 thump. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there you go. So now I'm thunder, and, <laughs> and then that stuck. And so it's just like, hey, don't fight it, just go with it. And yeah. uh, and then when I finished my doctorate, I was like, hmm. One of my students sent me. Uh, uh, Walmart has a knockoff of um, Dr Pepper called Dr Thunder. Okay. There you go. Dr. Thunder. Dr. Thunder. <laughs> there it is. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so those are the best, those, those are the best ones. Um, yeah, man. Well, I really appreciate your time and energy. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I really dig the, like I said, the seven, and that's a that's a show that I see frequently, and I was you know I was glad to see that you, you know, joined the show. Um, so I'll see you there. And I've also been checking out your um, uh, your 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 live streams. I guess you're in what episode? What is it? One thirty. What is that? One thirty three. One thirty three. Yeah. Three was the last one we did. So this week could be one thirty four. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's cool. Um, and. Yeah, I mean it's pretty controversial stuff. Some of the stuff that you say, but for the most part, I think you just say a lot of really common sense stuff. And I think that what happened, yeah. what's happened, is that people just can't hear straight, you know, reasoning anymore. It's it's like anything that you know is just common sense. What we used to call common sense, it's just it's just like that's controversy now. And yeah, it's. So it's, it just seems to me to be a lot of truth that you're, that you're speaking. And Mm -hmm. so I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, um, we all have a duty out here. I'm just, sometimes I'm just appalled and surprised at how people, you know, how they react to common sense. I'm like, yo, this shit should be like, you know, I'm not saying anything prolific. I don't understand why you guys don't get this stuff. So I don't know. It's just really odd to me. I mean, even like, for instance, um, cause you have, you've been pretty outspoken about black folks, you know, not being so loyal to the democratic party, you yeah. know, that seems, yeah. that doesn't seem like controversial to me. Just look at the track record. There's a lot yeah. of promises made and not much happening right and the last thing i heard i, I don't know if it, it's happened yet but black lives matter raised 10 billion dollars for biden i don't think that biden's right. team has met with black lives matter yet yeah exactly <laughs> you know yeah. it's just like another okie doke and and not that i agree with you know i mean the slogan of course i agree with black lives matter but we know that there's a political agenda there and in much of which i don't agree with um uh but yeah well that's all i have for you uh i really appreciate awesome, man. Uh, like i said your time and energy thanks for doing this um thanks for being responsive and uh this is uh 
this is cool. I'll uh, post this tomorrow. Awesome, man. Talk to you soon. All right, man. God bless. Take it easy.